Hello, dear farmers and listeners of this panel talk. Today we will talk about calcium in laying hands. I'm here together with Stefan Alius to discuss this very relevant topic. My name is Jorde Pandelaar and I'm working for AgriFirm and New Science in the Middle East and Africa. Together here with Stefan Alius, who is our poultry expert, and today I'll ask him some questions about calcium in laying hands. We will start with a simple calculation, as you see on the first slide. Our goal as a layer farmer is to achieve a production level of 300 eggs per hen per year. If you have 1% bad quality eggs, such as cracked or broken eggs, which you cannot sell, you lose about 3 eggs per hen per year. So 3 times multiplied by 0.1 US dollar per egg. This means you are losing 0.3 US dollar per hen per year. So for example, if you have 1,000 hens, you lose 300 US dollars per year. On the other hand, if you have 10,000 or 100,000 hens, then you are losing respectively 3,000 or 30,000 US dollars per year. So this means it is valuable to invest in good shell quality. But really, shell quality, why is it so important? Maybe Stefan, you can elaborate on this. The shell quality is really the limiting factor of uh, selling eggs. Um, usually, if you have uh, broken eggs, cracked eggs, or dirty eggs, you are not able to sell them anymore. So that means it is very important to have a good shell quality. As you can see on the actual slide, it really takes a long time for the hen to form a good egg with the proper shell uh, quality. Um, and that means <clears throat> that time is also a limiting factor besides nutrition and genetics and health. And there you also see that there is uh, an issue like if you have a really highly productive hen, the time the hen can spend to really form and mature and good eggshell is limited. So that at the end is also a limiting factor for the egg production. And if there is less time available to produce the egg, um, that can result in a lower extra quality. Okay, thank you, Stefan. You see that farmers can win or lose a lot with uh, when the shell quality is reduced. Can you maybe mention some of the most important factors which are determining the shell quality? Um, as you can see uh, on the slide which you showed, there are several factors which are influencing the egg. Uh, egg shell quality but also the internal quality of the egg. On top of the columns you see the four main factors which is breed, so what type of chicken do you use, the health status, is it healthy or does it have a disease, uh, the nutrition, so do you uh, supply the right type of feed and the egg handling of course. I mean if you crack your eggs while collecting them it is of course an issue. <clears throat> on the lines on the left side you see other or you see the factors which are influenced. So external egg quality means, for example, the egg size, uh, the breaking strength or the quality of the eggshell, and also the shell color. But there are, of course, some more invisible uh, traits, uh, internal egg quality, like the huff units, where you can see how fresh the egg is, the smell of the egg, the, the yolk share, uh, are there blood spots uh, in, the, in the egg? or for example also the yolk color. And you see that the, these parameters influence each other in, on a different way and on a different uh, strength. So for example, uh, you see on the top line, the breed and the nutrition have a, a huge impact on the egg size, while on the other hand, the egg handling has absolutely no influence on the egg size. So you see that there is a variety of parameters you have to be aware of. Uh, and which you can which can influence the quality of your egg internally and externally. Thank you for this information, Stefan. It's very useful for the farmers to know which factors they should pay attention to. So just before you mentioned that an egg production of an egg needs time. Well, I think it would be great for the farmers if we can give a little bit more information about the exact process and the duration of each sub-process. For this, I suggest we will look at the video.
On this video, we see a follicle which is ready to be ovulated. This is the eventual egg yolk that we will find in the egg, which is at the start of the journey to form the egg. As you can see, when there are blood vessels crossing the place where the egg yolk is ovulated, then there is the creation of blood spots. The egg yolk then starts the journey with going through the infundibulum. The infundibulum, here in the video as mentioned as the blue part is the upper part of the reproductive tract which you this part catches the follicle after it is ovulated and then as you can see it moves in the in the ovary tract At this moment, the egg yolk is not covered by egg white, as you can see. So this means it is very vulnerable for a bacteria, such as Salmonella. After going through the infundibulum, and which takes 15 minutes. The yolk is then transferred to the next stage. And the next stage in the ovary tract is called the magnum. As you can see here. Then during the next three hours, the yolk will be covered by a thick, dense layer of albumin. This is called the primary albumin. While the egg yolk is going through the magnum, it is turning around. And this is causing the formation of the chalaza, as you can see here. These chalaza, these structures, they will later keep the egg yolk in place in the egg. As you can see here in the video. After the magnum, the egg is transferred to the isthmus. Indeed, you. When entering the isthmus, you can see that uh, the shell membranes are deposited and there is an inner and an outer membrane which is uh, formed around the yolk and the chelator. You can here see in blue, which then later the is later uh, or is the more or less the setup for the later egg shell. As you can see here, <clears throat> while traveling through the isthmus, the egg doesn't really look like an egg. It's, it's more looking like a prune, so it's not the egg form which we later know. After the isthmus and the, the membrane deposition is done, it moves to the shell glands. And here it's really where a lot of time is consumed and, and a lot of things happen. You can see that there is first um, a, the so-called syn albumin is secreted uh, into the egg yolk. It's it's most, mostly a watery solution which really makes the egg uh, blow up or fill up. And there you see that it's really be getting the form of the later egg. Then it, uh, it moves forward and uh, um, quite highly concentrated solution of uh, calcium carbonate is uh, secreted uh, by the shell gland. Here you can see the growing calcite crystals. And these are really uh, during the growth and the linkage to each other build the shell, uh, the shell, the outside shell of the of the egg. The the latest part you can see here is the so-called uh, uh, cuticle, that is the protein layer, which is like uh, what you know from a Gore-Tex jacket. That means oxygen can go through it, but pathogens are not able to pass the, the shell anymore. So that is the latest or outside protection layer of the, uh, of the egg shell. 
and then after that is uh, done, it, uh, the egg is moving forward uh, to the vagina, is moving into the right position, and at the end, the hen is laying a new egg. Okay, that was very interesting. So we saw on the video that the egg shell is formed with calcium during 20 hours before laying the egg. This is a very long time. Most of the time, the chicken is laying the egg in the morning. This means that the egg shell is formed during the night when the birds are not eating. Then, Stefan, please tell me, where is the calcium coming from? You know, that is a very good and integral question. Um, as you already mentioned, as the hens are not feeding, they have no calcium available from the feed, you could imagine. Um, in that case, luckily, the uh, hens have a storage within their body. It's the so-called medullary bones. You can see on the um, slide in the darker blue. In these bones, it is possible for the hens to store calcium and mobilize it afterwards. If you can go to the next slide, we can um, explain a little more in detail. Exactly. Here you see the the pathway of the calcium in the body. So usually, for example, when feed is taken up, the, you know, the feed is passing the gizzard, the intestine, and at the end of the day, nutrients are taken up in the blood. Uh, so that is also valid for calcium. Then you have uh, two ways. Usually, if there is a necessity to consume the calcium, for example, for the shell building phase, it can be directly transferred from the blood to the oviduct, so to the reproductive system where the actual formation is taking place. In case that the demand is not that high for the moment, it is still possible that the calcium in combination with phosphorus and vitamin D3 is stored in the bones. That means that the bones, the medullary bones are mineralized, so they more or less grow stronger. Then, in case that there is no um, calcium available from the feed, but it is needed for egg shell formation, the hen is also able to mobilize that calcium from the medullary bones again. Therefore, you again need vitamin 3 to facilitate that mobilization. The phosphorus, which is usually linked to the calcium, will be excreted by the feces. The calcium is available in the bloodstream again and can be taken to the oviduct where it is used to the uh, um, shell formation. So, as a matter of fact, calcium should be present at the right time in order to use it directly in, for the egg shell formation. And this also to avoid too much deposition and mobilization from the medullary bones. This can be regulated with coarse calcium. In this graph, we try to explain you the absorption of fine calcium by the hens. So, for example, the, the hens start eating when the light goes on, let's say at 7 a.m. in the morning when the sun comes up. Because of the fine structure, the calcium is immediately available. However, if you look at the need of the calcium during that period of the day, you see that it's very low. The bird has just laid the egg. So it will take another 12, 14 hours before the calcium will be needed for the next egg shell. You see that the availability of calcium decreases around 6, 7 p.m. This is when the, when the hens, they stop eating because the sun is going down. Also, the availability of calcium is going down. On the contrary, at that period, the need for calcium is the highest. As a result, for the high need but the low availability, a lot of calcium is being mobilized from the bones. This you can see in the orange line. On the other hand, you can see on that slide here that if you use uh, a coarser form of calcium, that the <clears throat> graph is looking a little different. We, we take the same setup. That means usually when the sun is going up around 7 a.m., the hands start to eat again. But because the calcium source in the feed is coarser, that means the particle size is higher, it takes longer until the uh, calcium uh, is solved in, in the lumen and be, is available in the blood. That also means even if they stop eating at some point, like 7 p.m., 
there's still uh, calcium available in the intestine because the solution of the calcium takes more time. And as you can see here, you have the same story. The calcium need of the hen, which is the yellow graph, is going up when the actual formation is taking place in the evening or beginning of the night. Due to the fact that the solution of the calcium in the feed takes longer, you also see on the green graph that there is still a lot of calcium available when it is needed. The orange line that the calcium uptake from the medullary bone is less and that is quite good for the hen because it means less metabolic stress. So as a conclusion, we can say that if we feed our hands coarse limestone, the limestone becomes available when the birds need it, needs it the most. Indeed, yo, but as usual, there is also an optimum. So and as we can see in the picture, we prefer a coarse calcium uh, particle size of two to four millimeters. That is uh, by experience usually the best way of uh, supplying it on the feed. But you have to remember, we don't want to have unsoluble rocks, like you can see here on the picture. There is no added value because it is not solving in the in the lumen, so the calcium is not available for the hands. Okay, thank you, Stefan. So let's finalize with another calculation. How much limestone exactly should we feed our hands? Because this can also help the farmer to produce the feed. Well, yo, that is a, it's a very good question, as several in, uh, parameters influence the demand of calcium for the hand. It is good to have a look at it, at it uh, how we should determine the right, de uh, the right amount of calcium. So usually an egg is weighing around 60 grams. And basically you say 10% of that egg weight is the shell. That means six grams of uh, the 60 grams are the, the weight of the shell. So how much calcium do you need for the shell? 95% uh, of the shell is consisting of calcium. And calcium carbonate, which is limestone, which we usually uh, use in the, in the feed, is con uh, containing around 40% of, of uh, calcium. That means, we just uh, uh, twice it, we need around uh, 4.8 grams of calcium in the feed, as usually only like 50% are utilized. So that is why we have our really core and rough calcium demand. But then some other factors come into place, which is, for example, the solubility of the calcium, the laying performance of the hands, and also the feed intake of the hands. If we say, which is a very standard way, we have a good solubility of 95%, an, a very good laying performance of 90% and a good feed intake of 120 grams per hen and day. In the final feed, we need 3.8 grams of calcium in the feed. What happens now if one, some of the parameters are changing? Now we look to the right side. What happens, for example, if the hens are not eating enough? So it means the feed intake is not 120 grams, but only 105 grams but still the laying performance is quite high. Then we have to supply more calcium in the feed to get the right or sufficient level of available calcium for the hands. That means in the feed, we have to add 4.3 grams instead of 3.8 grams. So one parameter is changing, so the demand of the feed is changing. If we now look to the bottom left side, what for example happens if we use a calcium source which is not as soluble as estimated. We here say, okay, the solubility is only 65%. That means that we, to have a sufficient supply of calcium, we need to increase the level in the feed rather high. We have to have like 5.5 grams in the final feed, which is a lot more uh, than, uh, than we would, would like to have. And it also at the end costs money because we need to get the protein and the energy and everything else in the feed. On the last um, example, on the right side, we see what happens, for example, if the laying performance is lower. That means every hen in average is laying less eggs. That results in a lesser demand for calcium. So that means that not every hen is or the duration between X is longer per hen. So that also means that the demand for calcium is a little lower. There you see that we can 
uh, succeed with only 3.4 grams of calcium. So a lot of examples, but at the end of the day, it is really that you have to be aware what is happening in your barn. Uh, you have to uh, check on several parameters and only then you will uh, be able to supply the right amount of calcium in the feed for your layers. Okay, thank you Stefan uh, for this very nice calculation. Uh, hereby we came to the end of our uh, talk about calcium in laying hands. Uh, thanks everybody for watching and listening and I hope everybody learned something. Take care and bye bye.